Welcome to Connect Canyons, a podcast sponsored by Canyon School District. This is a show about what we teach, how we teach, and why. We get up close and personal with some of the people who make our schools great. Students, teachers, principals, parents, and more. We meet national experts, too. Learning is about making connections. So connect with us. Dust-sized particles have caused boulder-sized ripples for the Eastmont Middle Patriots. When asbestos was found in the dust that was kicked up while crews were replacing a floor during winter recess, it triggered a response with major implications. The school was immediately shuttered to the public. A cleanup plan was put into place. Eastmont students started attending classes at another building. To provide information to folks in the community who may understandably be concerned about the asbestos abatement, we sat down with Stephen Gailey, the Environmental Services Director of the company hired to oversee the cleanup. Listen for more about the asbestos, the cleanup process, the continual testing, and how the project must follow environmental guidelines. I'm Jeff Haney with Canyons District. Please enjoy the conversation with Mr. Gailey. So let's just set the stage. Right now, crews are hard at work on a mitigation process at Eastmont Middle School. How was asbestos found at the school? The way it was identified for this particular issue is uh, the assistant facilities director for Canyon School District uh, went in and uh, identified a contractor that was doing some polishing work on some subfloor to get it ready for a new floor to go in. Uh, when he looked at it, uh, he was concerned just because of the fact of it, it looked suspicious of something that could contain asbestos previously. So he called me. It was uh, in the evening, probably around 7 o'clock. And uh, when he sent me a picture via my phone, I, I thought it prudent if I should go down there and take a look at it myself. So I did, and I went down there, and uh, we actually tested it. Now, if we understand correctly, asbestos was in the adhesive that was holding down the tile in the hallway. So... Is asbestos dangerous in the solid form? When does it become problematic or toxic? Okay, that's uh, there, there's a couple of levels to this question. Let me let me address each one. First of all, the mastic that it was identified in was originally used to hold down a previous floor that existed in the school. It appeared, of course, we don't know exactly because we weren't there when it happened. It appeared that at some point this floor was removed, probably to put the current or the existing floor down that was there before it was disturbed a few weeks ago. And uh, then the new floor was put down with an adhesive to hold that floor down. So the mastic is actually located beneath the floor tile and beneath the adhesive on that particular tile. So that answers the first part of the question. The... Uh, for asbestos to become toxic, it's the interaction with the body. Uh, just with any other chemical, it's got, it's got to get inside. So when it becomes airborne and it's inhaled, typically that's, that's the, the toughest one to, to go with. And when it's inhaled into the lungs, the scratching and poking from those fibers, they are, have been known to con cause cancer. And that's why this is one of the most regulated materials that we currently have. Now, is this the first testing that has been done at Eastmont? It is not. Eastmont was tested somewhere between 1979 and 1982 originally. Uh, of course, we don't know the exact dates of when it was tested. And additional tests have continued on either a uh, six-month and annual basis uh, throughout through the school. And they're looking at many things such as accessibility, is it becoming damaged, uh, what, what's the condition. And so the, that's been going on at Eastmont continuously. So the, uh, the materials there are generally known, but not completely known. If I understand this correctly, particles become airborne during the grinding process as that flooring was being replaced during the winter recess. Is that how the asbestos was kicked up into the air? For this particular event, that is the case. The, uh, when the tile was removed, and then the contractor needed to polish or grind the floor. It was a fine polishing to receive the new floor that was coming in. Uh, when that polishing occurred, which was after hours, during break, and it was after hours, then uh, that grinding process actually made it airborne. That's when, of course, we needed to become involved. Now, the airborne particles, has it been contained to a hallway or did it get into the HVAC system and be spread throughout the entire building? Most of it was contained to a hallway. However, we 
do still need to identify uh, certain rooms that we haven't been able to get into. And, and the reason for that is we don't want to spread contamination as we go along. It's trying to isolate it where it mainly is and mitigate those issues before we enter another one. So we are uh, doing it in stages. And uh, it, it is so we can test that. One of the last testing stages is the HVAC system. We will test that, and it's part of the plan that was submitted to the Department of Environmental Quality for approval. And that plan says uh, one of the last things we'll do is test the HVAC system and, and take mitigation steps as necessary based on those results. Explain the testing process. The testing process for the uh, – in general, it's a little different because we deal with different tests and different materials. So bulk materials are tested one way, air samples are tested another, and of course we have multiple air samples that we can take. In this particular case, we know the material is located or was located in the mastic, so we didn't need to do much bulk sampling there. So right now what we're doing is uh, air sampling. The air samples uh, do range. There's two different ways to do it. One of them is called um, phase contrast microscopy. We call it PCM for short. And that identifies fibers in the air and it counts them. And then we can compare those to OSHA standards to identify if it's a hazard above the permissible exposure limit. However, in the case of a school, a school is much more highly regulated than other institutions. K through 12 public and private schools are highly regulated, and that's where the uh, asbestos rules originally started for AHERA or the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act. And uh, those indicate we will do a – I'll call it a little more uh, intense – analysis. And those are done by TEM or transmission electron microscopy. With that particular method, we can identify fibers and specific fibers and say, yes, this fiber is an asbestos fiber and here's the type. So we can actually see single fibers if we need to down to those levels. And that's how we're doing the testing because it is a school. Now, is this testing done by an independent lab? It is. It's done by uh, an independent consultant, which is us, contracted to uh, – subcontracted to the district. But it's also done by an independent laboratory that is accredited. Um, we use uh, a NAVLAP, National Voluntary Laboratory Accreditation Program, um, test method. And we also uh, – they also – the microscopist actually has to be PAT tested, a proficiency analytical tested. And that's a federal testing that comes out and they have to make sure they're certified to read these samples appropriately. So for the layman, for the non-expert, for the parents uh, and the faculty, so explain the process of how you gather the samples. To gather the samples for the air, what we do is we uh, take an air pump and we pull a known volume of air over a cassette. The air pump is measured over time so we know how much air we have pulled. It goes into the cassette. Fibers are trapped onto the cassette as they come through. And then we can take those cassettes to the laboratory under chain of custody, and the laboratory microscopist will cut little sections out, and they'll read those under a stereoscope and identify what's in the, in the material. Okay, so how many samples are taken, meaning how often do you test as you're doing the mitigation process? What we do for the air sample portion is we will test specific areas. So we have multiple floors in this building. There are, of course, three separate floors. Uh, we can do a whole floor at a time, um, but on the first floor, that's not going to be – that was where the cause of the issue uh, started. It was on the first floor, the bottom floor, I should say. So on that one, we'll have to divide it up into smaller sections, and we'll have to do it so in some cases maybe by rooms versus whole floors. And uh, we do it as the clearance occurs. The clearance occurs visually first, and then we make sure we lock everything down and it's tested, and then we, uh, we do the air testing and submit those for clearance. What do you mean when the clearance occurs? A clearance is uh, a twofold. Uh, the first clearance required is you need to do a visual clearance to identify visually, is there any asbestos that I can see? If you can see dust, um, if you pass your finger along it and you see residue along your finger, well, that's not a passing of a clearance. It's got to be clean. Um, then when it's visually gone, then we do an air cl uh, clearance, and it is an aggressive clearance, meaning we blow the air around inside that containment that is engineered and designed to change that air out through filters. We actually test that air um, over time. So we have to pull at least uh, 740 liters, and then we'll, we'll probably end up pulling somewhere around the neighborhood of 1,300 to 2,500 liters just to get a good precise reading, and then we'll turn those in for testing as we come. So how can the public be assured that this testing is valid? 
They can be assured because all this information, you know, when we're complete, will enter the government system. Uh, it's not only the public school that we're dealing with. We also have the Department of Environmental Quality, which is uh, the, a state entity. And then uh, all this information is goes to the Department of Environmental Quality and can, can be grammar requested at any time. It's also all the, the engineering processes that we implement for this are actually approved by the Department of Environmental Quality prior to us implementing them. So your work, in essence, is double-checked? It is absolutely double-checked. And okay. not only is it double-checked, when it goes to the Department of Environmental Quality, they ran roundtable it up there also. And they'll roundtable it, and then they come back with us. And it's, it's a discussion more than anything else. Now, you mentioned the Utah DEQ. Uh, when we have situations like this at a school, we have to submit a plan for the mitigation. So did the plan for mitigation in Eastmont receive approval from the DEQ? It did receive approval from DEQ, specifically from the uh, Division of Air Quality, the ATLAS section. Uh, that plan was written under the emergency conditions, uh, and the reason is it was in a, during a holiday. No one was around. Everybody was on vacation, and we went ahead and executed the initial portion to seal that up. And we wrote that plan and said, this is what we're going to do. Uh, there were some discussions on it, and then uh, that plan is now uh, what we will follow uh, but we could have – it is a living document. We can change it along the way if we find things we need to do more intensely. Were there any changes or have been, there been any changes to the plan that was originally submitted for approval? There haven't been any formal written changes. The initial draft plan uh, did come back with some questions from the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, an example of that would be uh, we referenced uh, we'll do an AHERA, Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act, clearance. And uh, they said, well, we want to know which one you're going to do and we want you to be specific. And that's not a problem. We just spelled it out and said, okay, we're going to do these and this is what the regulation requires and then we'll do those. Okay. So, you know, understandably, there are parents who are concerned about whether the building will be safe once the mitigation process is over. You know, we've heard at least one parent at the most recent Board of Education meeting who asked if asbestos was sucked into the HVAC system and spread throughout the building. So how can we ease their concerns that the building will be safe once the mitigation process is over? Uh, first of all, I will tell you, by having children myself, they are, of course, older now. Um, if I were a parent, I would want to be directly involved with this situation myself. I'd want the information to come to me, uh, especially with me being the expert. I'd want to actually put my eyes on it and take a look at it also. Parents can absolutely do that. They can see these records at the school district. They can see these records at Department of Environmental Quality. Um, parents can be assured because we must follow not only the regulation, but we have to follow the plan, which was put in place, which gives us additional restrictions or constraints, I should say, that we need to follow. These are all documented as we go, and all of this information has a, has a set precedence, and it'll all be logged in when we are done, and everyone will take a look at it and have and, and be okay with it before it's opened. Now, explain, if you would, please, the mitigation process at the building right now. Uh, it, draw a picture for us. What are crews doing? Are they going room to room and wiping down all surfaces with rags, what detergents are being used to clean. Explain to those who haven't seen this mitigation process before what is happening right now at the building. The way the process occurs is we needed to clean the air out first because we've got these particles flying around in the air. So we put critical barriers up on windows, doors, uh, portals inside along hallways and separated the entire building from itself, basically. Everything was compartmentalized. We put it under negative pressure and, uh, that, and we're cycling all that air through negative air units. The air is cleaned on the way out to 0.3 microns in size and those fibers are trapped inside those filters. When, as the air was being cleaned, we also then came in and did uh, what we call stabilization. We came in and took all that dust that was created and got rid of that on using wet methods. Wet methods would, of course, hold down that dust, and we can clean that up, and we do HEPA vacuuming. HEPA vacuum stands for high-efficiency particulate air, and it's another filtration system that's used when, when it, uh, it occurs. Once that was done... Then what we needed to do is take that mastic that was down there, and we had to get rid of that also. So that has been mostly removed from the floor. We've still got a few corners and edges that need to be addressed. But um, then what we do is move into rooms. 
Uh, we can use walls and ceilings as containments. Of course, we put polyethylene sheeting on those, and those can be barriers which would preclude fibers from moving in and out. However, because we have an HVAC system, we need to go in and visually check every room upon itself. So that's being occurring also. Visually, we'll identify, and then we're also taking what's called microvac samples. Microvac samples are not required under the regulation under AHERA. However, uh, they're also not regulated by the Department of Environmental Quality. So really, they have no say in that. But we implemented that as additional control measures. We put that into the plan because these particular microvac samples are done by TEM, and we can actually see one single fiber. We know presence or absence. So if I can do those microvac samples and see what I'm pulling up from a carpet or hard sur surface, then I know if it's clean or not. And then I can submit that information to DEQ to make additional decisions. We don't say clean or, or clear or not clear based on that information. It's additional information for us. How much longer will that mitigation process happen at Eastmont? Hey, that's a really, really tough question, okay? We are already in the process of turning over a few rooms, and we have one from the outside that we actually have already cleaned and, and people can now access, and, and that's for the uh, principal to access certain things. Um, so we can do it in stages, but uh, we need to understand this is a very difficult process. This is an entire building. There are soft surfaces in here. Uh, many of these soft surfaces we won't be able to get back. I, I noticed there was some uh, children's projects in some display cases, and I was looking at those. And as soon as I'm looking at the contractor, he's looking at them too, and he looks at me, and I said, they have to go. I said, we cannot certify these as clean, and we'll have to, we'll have to uh, make sure those get taken care of. And in the interest of protection of health, it just needs to be done. So though we go section by section, we look at everything along the way. So um, I will say it will for sure be closed through the end of January, and we will be into February, could push the end of the month. Okay. So what, in your experience, is the greatest misconception about asbestos and asbestos mitigation? In my opinion, in my experience, from what I have seen and what I am uh, asked about is uh, asbestos, uh, first of all, any exposure to asbestos, it's going to occur. Um, if you drive down Las Vegas, it's naturally occurring. And uh, they're building an interstate through there. As a matter of fact, in 2012, there was a, a whole article p pushed out by this. So it is naturally occurring. It's ubiquitous. Um, if we walk down the streets of Salt Lake City, if we walk down the streets of San Francisco, Chicago, you're going to breathe it. If you walk down the street of Lehigh, you will breathe it. Um, it's just a fact um, because we have used it so intensely over the past hundreds if not thousands, and there are documented cases going back thousands of years, at this material is just out there. What we do is, since it is an issue, is um, we try to educate the public. It's If you can see it, it's not – that's actually not what's going to hurt you. It's what you can't see, and you are inhaling that is more of the problem. Uh, asbestos has no smell. It has no taste um, that uh, – unless you do large quantities, of course. Uh, so you, you really can't tell it's there. Um, it's the disturbance of the material that releases it to the air. That's when the concern comes in, which is highly – it is incredible that this happened during a, a shutdown of the school and didn't contaminate um, the, the school when they were there. Right. And you have done these types of projects at other schools, and you've been able to get that, quote, unquote, clean bill of health for students to return. Yes, we have. Uh, R&R &R Environmental has been doing this for 25 years. Uh, we've been working for the uh, state of Utah for 25 years. Uh, we have other large clients we do it for. We are intimately involved with school systems and, and how we do it uh, on not only the Canyon School District, but other school districts uh, we are, we're on contract with to make sure they're taken care of on, in their needs. So this will hopefully be heard by a lot of parents in the Eastmont community. Give them one last message. What do you want them to know about the process that you're following to address the issue there at Eastmont? Uh, what I'd like you to know is be involved, first of all. Ask the questions. They're important to you, and they should be important to you. Um, and uh, the, the individuals in, in the school, I, I would expect, and, and even myself, are here to, to make sure questions are answered. Um, ask the questions, and then you can take a look at the data, uh, we will not turn over a school that is not clean. If it's not certified as clean, if we have doubts, we will not turn it over to the Department of Environmental Quality for them to even take a look at. For now, students and teachers remain at the old Crescent View Middle Building. 
They'll stay there for at least another month and probably longer. The aim right now of everyone involved is to make sure the mitigation project is done and done right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Connect Canyons. Connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Canyons District or on our website, canyonsdistrict.org.